<laughs> Who can tell me what this is a slide of? Heat production. Heat. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Very good. Okay. Now, do it with your right eye closed, or your left eye closed. Anyway. All right. So, the big thing to remember, when we're doing x-rays, the biggest thing that we produce is not x-ray. Mostly what we're producing is heat. We produce a lot of heat in those tubes. Tube design has progressed incredibly since the early days. Um, it used to be that you... When I was a student, we had tube rating charts. You have tube rating charts and all the documentation you have for the rooms that you're doing. The difference is, is that I doubt anybody here ever has to refer to those. New <coughs> tubes have an incredible That's amount of, of, of heat loading available. We had situations where we put enough heat into the tube that it fractured and broke. Um, the tubes just weren't designed for it. Uh, but it's a whole, whole new world. So lots of heat. Um, that's about it. Anybody remember what x-ray tubes are made of? Glass. Glass? Plexiglass. Oh no, hot scotch? Plexiglass. Plexiglass. Oh, that's the board for patients. Yeah, it's glass. What? It's not leaded glass. No. It's a glass. It's heavy duty. It's, it's, it's a Pyrex type. It, it, it has to be, number one, very strong. Okay, because it's under an extreme vacuum. Okay, these take they take these down to a really high, high vacuum. It has to be really strong in heat resistance because it produces a lot of heat. There's some ways, there are ways to transfer that heat out as best they can. They've got the oil surrounding the housing and recirculate that, but there's still a lot of heat. It's got to take that. It's got to be pretty shock resistant. Um, and you don't want it to have really anything in it that's going to create secondary x-rays or anything else. You want it to be nice, clean glass. But mostly, heat is the big thing, so you do need to be aware. So you got electrons going from the cathode to the anode at about half the speed of light. It's called projectile electrons. Um, some are not of sufficient energy to ionize the target atoms. So 99% of the kinetic energy the projectile electrons converted to heat. Um, so as far as the efficiency of producing voltage at 60 kV, it's about a half a percent efficient. 100 kV is about 1%. 20 million volts, like in therapy, is about 70% efficiency. So you can see, so where does the other 99% go? Heat. Anybody recognize what this is? Da, da, da. No, it's a target for darts. <laughs> Scatter a dish. Okay, it's going to be one of those nine. We are talking about Brehm radiation. That's a short form for Brehm Shalom, which is German for breaking radiation. Okay. And all that is is that a projectile electron comes in and it kind of interacts close to the <coughs> nucleus and in slowing down, because that's what it's doing, it's the nucleus is gonna extend some force on that, it's gonna produce an X-ray. And the X-ray is a variable radiation. So it's deceleration of the electron near the nucleus energy of the x-ray photon may be the original energy or less. So it can be anything between zero and what your kV is. There's no involvement in the orbital tungsten shells. Constitutes 90% of the emitted radiation okay, as the Z atomic number increases. Uh, you get better uh, strength, better x-rays. And the average x-ray energy is about one third of the original. So for 100 kVp, it's gonna be around 30 to 35 is gonna be the peak of that Brems curve, okay? Hmm. Um, characteristic. So 
little bit different. The electron comes in, removes an electron from one of the inner orbits that creates uh, an X-ray and an ejected electron that goes on and interacts differently. But this is a footprint. It's a fingerprint. If you know the energy of the emitted X-ray, you know what the material is that the electron interacted with. So whether it's lead, tungsten, uranium, gold, silver, there will be a characteristic X-ray. And it'll tell you exactly what it is. Electron interacts with inner shell electron, ejects it, the electron from an outer shell fills the hole and produces that X-ray photon. So what it is is those, as you knock an electron out of orbit, one of those higher orbital electrons drops down to fill that void, and in so doing, releases energy that is characteristic of the material. K-shell is the only one with sufficient energy for radiography. So all of the characteristics that we would see are called K-shell x-rays. There's a K-shell, L-shell, M-shell, N-shell, um, but only the K-shell will produce a uh, characteristic. The energy is characteristic of the target material. We talked about that. It's due to the difference in binding energy. <coughs> characteristic radiation is about 10% of the x-ray production. Um, for the x-ray tubes that we use that are tungsten based, you will not get any characteristic below 69 kV, because that's the binding, the lowest, bind, or the highest, that's the binding energy of the K-shell for tungsten. So at 68, you're not gonna get anything. You have to be 69 or above. Um, changes in other factors will affect the quantity of characteristic radiation, but not the value. Like I said, this is a fingerprint. It's an identification. This is a typical plot. Uh, it looks like a 90 kVp. So you notice it comes up. You got this this curve at about a third or so, and then it falls off. So you have this extreme range. <laughs> what can you tell me about? the x-rays down in this end. Do they have value? They get attenuated. They don't get value for the image, but they get attenuated by the body. <clears throat> well, we hope, actually, we hope not. We hope to do something with these beforehand. But yeah, that's exactly, these, Observed from an by imaging filter. point of view, mm -hmm. only provide dose to the patient or the patient's skin. They are not sufficient. So that's the purpose behind, I don't know if it's in this lecture or not, should uh, filtration, I think there is something on attenuation, to filter some of this low end out so that we get more imaging uh, <coughs> ability. Oops. Okay. Um, so this is the difference between 200 MA and 400 MA at 90. Um, you can see the, the peak is at about the same place. But here's the characteristic fingerprint right at 69. And you can see that it's a very s small part of uh, the bead. So again, notice the quantity, the characteristic radiation, but not the change in energy. <clears throat> and that's just another characteristic. Notice too now the difference between 80 kV and 100, you get of course the shift of the peak, because again, it's about one third. So as you keep raising kVp, your maximum will move slightly to the right. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> filtration. So filtration 
is the aim is to reduce this lower end so that it reduces patient dose to the skin and and for to get rid of x-rays that aren't going to be worth anything for imaging but filtration this is with two millimeters so you get a little bit of saving four but you drop everything okay so filtration will change everything but notice down here a lot of this real low end stuff is gone so four millimeters is pretty typical um, although I've tested rooms that had about six a CT scanner will usually have somewhere between 12 and 15 millimeters of aluminum and of course they'll have also filtration that is is different shapes to help um, shape the beam but uh, so again, think about how much heat loading goes into the tube because you have to overcome that so you have enough x-rays to image your, your patient. Atomic number is important. That determines both the shape of the curve and, and uh, the characteristics of the x-ray. So you have molybdenum, which is, uh, has a Z of 42. So it's used for what? What do we use molybdenum? anodes for. Anybody know? Mammography. Mammography. Mammography uses, uh, usually it's, it's, most of the modern tubes now are actually a combination of moly and rhodium so they can take a little more heat. Um, but yeah, so you got molybdenum, you got rhodium with its characteristics, uh, you got tungsten, gold, <clears throat> Notice gold. Gold looks pretty good, right? It, it, it's, it's got a higher Z, bigger Brems curve, really nice characteristic. We should have anodes made of gold, right? Mm -hmm. Melting point. Melting point. Melting point. You have to consider the, also the thermal characteristics of the material that you're putting heat into. Tungsten can take the heat. Gold would be a very expensive tube, and it would melt. So, factors that affect the X-ray emission spectrum. MA, the number and strength of Brems radiation, the number of characteristic radiation, and the strength of the characteristic radiation. Okay. That kind of makes sense. We know. MA is, the, is the, the number of photons you're gonna get. KV, the number and strength of the Brems ran, the number of the characteristic radiation, and the strength. So both of these affect. Filtration will change the effective energy of the Brems radiation. It will also change the number because you're gonna take some of those lower lower energy photons out of the beam um, and it's going to reduce the amount of characteristic radiation photons. It won't change the energy but it will change how much you get. Okay. And then Z affects it depending on what you make your anode out of so it affects the strength of the characteristic radiation. So through a lot of experimentation we have found that um, a combination molybdenum slash rhodium was really good for film screen mammography but for digital mammography direct they're finding no you can use tungsten because digital radiography takes a little higher energy so Molly was used because we needed the inherent contrast of low KVP photons, right? But for, for digital, it's processed. So it can determine the slight variation and we can use uh, tubes that have better heat loading. Probably most of the machines still being sold have that Molly, rhodium, possibly a little bit of tungsten in the tube. Um, so you can use slightly higher 
Film screen mammal was typically done between 24 and 28 kvp. Digital mammo is probably 30 to 35. That's the, the difference. So tube design has a lot to do with what we're doing today. Okay. anyone describe classical? Now this is the interaction of x-rays, not the interaction of electrons. We've already done the tubes. This is what comes out of tubes. So you have x-rays interacting with matter. Okay. We've got classical. We've got Compton, photoelectric, hair production, and photo disintegration. Okay. Now two of these we don't use. I'm going to talk about those first. Hair production, I always like to get this right because I get them confused. So basically, hair production is the creation of a, an electron and positron pair. It interacts with the nucleus. And it interacts with the, the energy field around the nucleus. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just a neutron gets changed into a proton and electron. Every textbook I read in physics, graduate physics, they just talk about the energy field. So it's like <clears throat> a, an x-ray comes in and magically, through quantum physics, becomes a natively charged thing and a positively charged Thing. Now, the negatively charged particle, if you will, goes on and just gets captured by any, any atom or molecule that's looking for a spare electron. The positive one, however, goes off, finds an electron, and creates two photons. Each one is 511 kb, k, keV. So pair production only happens at around 1.2 MeV. Below that, you can't get pair production. We don't use energies like that in diagnostic, so we can basically um, ignore that. Photo disintegration is um, a little bit different. Happens in therapy. <clears throat> so you're looking at something tw and the million electron volt area um, and I think I'm just going to totally ignore that one because you'll never run into that even for those of you that are considering radiation therapy uh, that's not going to be a, a consideration these we're concerned with classical Compton photoelectric I still believe any technologist who thoroughly understands Compton and photoelectric can basically answer any interaction question on any test. You just have to remember what each one of these does, and we're going to talk about that. So, this is what we call classical scattering. Um, this is kind of easy, actually. X-ray comes in, you got this atom here, and an X-ray goes out. No interaction. Like in baseball, the pitcher pitches the ball, batter just sits there, it's outside the strike zone, he doesn't take a strike at it, it just kind of goes into the catcher's glove. Not even a swing and a miss, it's just right straight through. Energy going in, is the same energy photon going out. It ch might change direction, probably will change direction, but it's the same photon. Okay. 
So, for classical, the interaction is between low energy X rays and atoms below 10 kV. So, even in a filtered mammography beam, you would see a fair amount of classical, but it's really low energy. The X ray photon loses no energy. The angle of the incident photon is the angle of scattered photon. In, angles out, no harm, no foul. No ionization, also called coherent. Rayleigh, who basically coined or discovered the interaction, unmodified. It's underlined because unmodified tends to be what you're going to see on tests, both here and ASRT. It's also called Thomson. But in any test anywhere, you might see any one of those four. But they're all the same. All describe the same thing. Okay. This looks like, what do you think this looks like? It's kind of obvious. This is Compton. Or modified. So, that's the interaction between moderate energy, x-rays, and the atom. Interacts with outer shell electrons. This is important. Outer shell electrons ionization does occur. So it's going to throw an electron out, an outer electron. It's going to bump it out. Photon will change direction. The increased, if you increase the angle of scatter, decrease the photon energy. So the amount of energy the photon escapes with is dependent on angle. It's independent of atomic number. And backscatter, the photon, is directed back towards the source. So if you look at any plot of a Compton scatter distribution, if this is the x-ray tube, and I'm shooting this way, Compton, most of it, will backscatter back towards the tube and then various amounts depending on the angle. Compton is what you worry about because this is your exposure. Mm -hmm. This has very little to do with patient exposure. They get some from this. Mostly Compton will generate issues with your image, causing some fog, unnecessary exposure to patient tissue, but mostly we're concerned about the Compton that comes out of the patient and interacts with you. That's why we have like gloves, aprons, glasses, lead shields. This is what you are protecting yourself against. Illustration of photoelectric. Okay, now we're talking about what affects the patient. incident photon is totally absorbed, so it goes away. It is absorbed by the interior, usually an interior electron, and all of that energy for that photon goes into that electron. Kind of like pool. You know, you got two balls. One's at rest, you shoot the cue ball into the ball. Cue ball stops and that other ball takes off. All that energy goes off into that other ball. All of the energy from the x-ray photon then goes into the electron. Ionization occurs when the inner shell is ejected. Incident photon disappears. That photoelectron is ejected. Incident photon has to be greater than the K-shell energy, obviously. Inner shell electrons ejected and outer electron shell, outer electron uh, fills the orbit producing characteristics. So 
you get characteristic radiation, you get a high energy electron flying through a short amount of tissue, which is then going to what? Interact again and again, and electrons successfully, successful, successively interact, releasing that energy to the surrounding tissue. Electrons don't go very far. So this is patient exposure. This is also what controls the attenuation in your image. This is why tissue, photons go pretty much through. They don't, there's not a lot of photoelectric interaction. Or bone, oh, there's a lot. You get stopped, you get your very well attenuated. Secondary, remember secondary? Dependent on the Z of the absorber. Remember, the Z of our tissue isn't much, right? Because it's mostly what? Oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, calcium. Binding energies of human body atoms are very low. Carbons is uh, 0.3 K keV, oxygen is 0.5 keV, calcium is four. Binding energy is important. Photoelectric, so I look at it this way. Photoelectric is P for patient. That's where all that energy goes. Compton is for you. Don't confuse the two. Attenuation depends on tissue thickness and a tissue type, atomic, ten, atomic number and density. Obviously, bone is going to attenuate more than soft tissue, which is going to attenuate more than fat. This is whole the, the premise behind CT and why you, you have different CT numbers for um, white tissue in the brain, bone, lung, all those types of things. Those are all different attenuations. So, properties of x-ray. They travel in straight lines. Can't be focused, can't curve, just got straight lines. Invisible. highly penetrating, they will darken photographic film, polyenergetic heterogeneous, they ionize, electrically neutral in and by themselves, but can create ionization. They can create chemical and biologic changes, which is why we have concerns about and issues in radio biology and there's scatter and secondary radiation produced and it can't be focused so you have frequency versus wavelength so as your wavelength goes down wavelength becomes shorter your frequency goes up, inversely proportional. Low frequency, high wavelength. Low frequency, long W, high frequency, short. So which one has the higher energy? Low energy. I look pretty much the same. <clears throat> I don't know. Is that true? All has to do with how high it is. 
Okay, inverse square law. You guys have done a lot with this, right? You're doing a lot with it, that in your labs and things, right? The intensity of an x-ray is has 30 mR at two meters. What's the intensity of one? How many people are here? Damn. <laughs> I'm hallucinating. I see a classroom full of people. Well, what a day that pizza. <laughs> what a good <laughs> Who can tell me what the inverse square law is? Oh, this is inverse square. I see at least a half a dozen faces in this room that I know they can because I was in class with them. Who wants to do it? I saw a hand. Go ahead. Inverse square law. Big I over little I is equal to little B squared over big B squared. Is right? Intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. I think I'm going home on these next year. I like that idea. <laughs> if you at one half the distance, you take the distance, you cut it in half, your intensity is what? Four times. Four times. Okay? If I double the distance, it is one quarter. So if you if it's one third the distance, it's nine. Anyway. It's 120. Yes, 120. There we go. So if it's 30 at 2, it's 120 at 1. Four times. Very good. This is a review. So smart. Yeah. So smart. Nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, once we get on to clickers, you're going to get a real surprise. Yeah, I know. How much we forget? Ah, it's Lynn's idea, so I can blame her. Uh, correction credit comes to guessing. No, <laughs> becomes no, guessing. No, 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 no extra credit. credit. Okay, who can tell me what the direct square law is? So it has to do with technical factors. So mass has to be directly proportional to the distance from the source. So as, as the distance from the source increases, the mass has to increase as well. No. No, dire direct square law. Yeah, as the distance increases, mass has to be increased as well. I believe in myself too here. <laughs> so I just heard somebody say that if, it, if 80 mass is used at 40 inches, that 160 mass is used at 20 inches. Doesn't sound other, right to me. Other way. No, other way. Other way. Other way. Oh, I think it's okay. mass so one it's mass over mass one two over mass two. Equal yeah. distance mass one D1 one squared over D2 squared. Yeah. 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 Equals. See, I know there's two guys right here that could stand up here and tell you all about this stuff, and I'm not hearing anything from them. Come on, guys. You know this stuff. This is review. You're not this helping is at all. This related to how much energy you're going to use. So if it's in half, you cut the energy in half. Go wrong. Direct square law has to do with the distance. And technical Where factors. So the the bigger the distance, the higher the technical factor needs to be used. The shorter the distance, the less the mass is used. <laughs> okay. No what comment. controls the number of electrons <laughs> produced at the cathode? The number? Mm -hmm. MA, yeah. The number of electrons produced at the cathode is what? Okay. You have to remember your your lesson in X-ray generator physics and two physics. Remember, you got two circuits. the The circuit that drives the electrons to the anode is in 
kilovolt and milliamperes. The current that actually lights up that filament is in volts and amps. It's like plugging in it, like plugging in a light bulb. Okay. You have to. Did anybody sh show you the mock tube that we have that's actually hooked up to electricity so you can see what happens to that filament? They didn't show that the first year? The hand freeze one? Yeah. No? Maybe they show, but a lot of things happen since then. How are you doing this? Oh. Oh, my word. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to ask about That was a very expensive demonstration that I got one of our service engineers at Kaiser to build and donate to the school. Anyway, so it's an it's amps that drive to basically light this up to create what? What's the process? Thermionic emission. See, you guys learned that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more years we'll learn the laws. Yeah. So the number of electrons produced at the cathode is is amperage. Okay. What drives the electrons from the cathode to anode? KV. 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 So voltage drives them across. Amperage makes them. What does time control? That's an easy question. Time controls how long. How long they're being shot across there. What is the charge of the focusing cup? Negative. Okay. Because why? You guys want to push the beam together. Like charges oppose. So they use the negative charge and it drives those them electrons to as closely packed as they can. Okay. Um. And uh, so that's the charge. And the purpose of the focusing cup is what we just said, is to help focus those thermionic electrons into a controlled beam to impact the anode. <laughs> beam quality. So, who knows what the 15% rule is? I do. Um, 15%. Who said I do? Okay, what is it? If you double the mass, you have to reduce the KV by 15%. Well, actually, it's, yeah, if, basically it's based on if you drop your KV, you have 15%. You have to double your mass double your to mass. get the same density on your. Yeah, and that's rule of thumb. No. Okay, and then beam quality is also affected by filtration. Half value layer. Let me go back to that. Does anybody know what the minimum legal half value layer is for a diagnostic diagnostic X-ray tube used on human beings in the state of California at 80 kVb? No, two point five. Oh. It's the minimum filtration you can have in an x-ray tube anywhere in California. Anybody want to take a guess what the typical half value layer is of the equipment you're using out in your respective clinical sites? No, probably about the half value layer. So this is not total filtration. This is half value layer. So that's about 